and I don't like that part of it. <laughs> we hope for a smooth transition when we get a new change in government. We desire a smooth transition when new ownership takes over a business, when two schools merge together, when an organization moves into a new facility, or when we move to a new town or even move to a new job. We want a smooth transition when two families are brought together to form a new family. But this morning we're going to look at a, at a time of transition in the nation of Israel. A very important time. It's the account of the change of power between Saul and David. Now as we know, the people chose King Saul because he stood ahead over everyone else. He was handsome. He was broad. He was probably a lot like me. Uh, I don't mean broad like that. I meant shoulders, okay? Uh, but they picked him out because he looked good. Israel picked him out because they wanted a king. God said, you have no need for a king. I'm your king. But we want a king. We want to be like everybody else. We want a king. We want to be like those nations. You don't need a king. I'm your king. And so God gave them the desires of their heart, and it caused them a lot of grief for a whole long time. I think that's the same thing that happened in America. We want a king. Whoa, 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 wait a minute. Wait a minute. This is one nation under God. I, I'm your king. But we want a king. We want to be like those who have a ruler. We want, we want a sugar daddy to take care of us. We don't want to be responsible for our own stuff no more. Wouldn't it be easier just to, to, to put somebody in the White House that will take care of us, give us phones, pay our house payments? You know, I mean, come on. That's cool. It sounds good. And God gave us the desires of our heart, and it caused a lot of grief in our country. Now, if you remember, David was probably anointed to be the next king in his mid to, to late teens. In fact, I... I happen to think it was closer to the 13, 14, 15 mark, but many of the commentators said the mid to, to late teens, so they're a lot smarter than I am, so that's what you get. Now, first, he works in Saul's administration as someone who was able to calm that uh, calm Saul when the evil spirit came upon him. And uh, then he spent many years on the run, uh, fleeing from the jealous king. Now, here we are. David is 30 years old, or, or just about, uh, it tells us in chapter 5, verse 4 of 2 Samuel, and David finally becomes a king. He was anointed, anointed as king many, many years ago, but now, finally, David is becoming king. But this transition, this doesn't happen as easily as it sounds. So as 1 Samuel comes to a close, comes to a conclusion, we're told of Saul's death. 1 Samuel chapter 31, verses 3 to 6, tells us that the Israelites were at war with Philistines. And in verse 3, it says, The fighting grew fierce around Saul, and when the archers overtook him, they wounded him critically. Saul said to his armor bearer, Draw your sword and run me through, or these uncircumcised fellows will come out and run me through and abuse me. But his armor bearer was terrified and would not do it. So Saul took his own sword and fell on it. When the armor bearer saw that Saul was dead, he too fell on his sword and he died with him. So Saul and his three sons and his armor bearer and all his men died together that same day. And just so that you'll know, included in that was also David's best friend, Jonathan, Saul's son. So today we want to pay attention to what David does next. That's the setting we got. King Saul, three of his sons, his armor bearer, a big portion of his soldiers all were dead. Israel was Israel was troubled was 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 whipped. They lost the battle. And we want to see what David does next. With Saul and his sons dead, there's going to be a change of leadership in Israel. And what David, the man after God's heart, does next can teach us about some of its characteristics, and, and it can also teach us about affecting smooth transitions in the changes of life. The first thing we see about David is David showed honor to his predecessor. Now, I'm going to admit to you, I've been in this situation several times, and this is a hard one. But David and his men have just returned from their own battle, if you'll remember from our last message. 
they were out fighting with the Amalekites after they had pillaged Ziglag, uh, which was the hometown of David. And then an Amalekite arrived with word of the battle between Israel and the Philistines. Uh, now, if you'll remember, this is really, really important. If you'll remember, this was the same battle that David almost had to fight uh, against Israel with the Philistines, but they wouldn't let him. Do you remember how bummed out David was that he couldn't go? I mean, he, hey, I'm trustworthy, I'm everything, or whatever. And God spared him. He reported that Saul and his three sons were all dead, and it was a devastating victory for the Philistines. Now David asked the man, how do you know? How do you know this to be true? And the man said that he had saw Saul himself, and he took pieces of his armor and gave it to David. You know, it's interesting that he, that even, even, even this Amalekite seemed to know that David, that David was destined to be the next king of Israel. And so the Amalekite also told David that he found Saul on the sword in agony, and, and that Saul had asked him to finish him off, and he obliged. Now we don't know whether this is true. We don't know whether the Amalekite was embellishing the story, which was probably most likely because we just read the other part. That, uh, but it's kind of vague. It just says that Saul died that day. Anyway, uh, he, the Amalekite might have been kind of embellishing the story uh, in order to, he thought, raise his standing with the new king. So we're so told in uh, 2 Samuel chapter 1, go ahead and flip over, 2 Samuel chapter 1, verse 11 to 12, that when that happened, David and all the men with him took hold of their clothes and tore them. They mourned and wept and fasted until evening for Saul and his son Jonathan and for the army of the Lord and the house of Israel because they had fallen by the sword. By the sword. Now I'm not sure where you're at here, man. I'm not sure how much you've been keeping up. I hope you've been keeping up with this. But I find this very, very interesting. Saul has been in hot pursuit of David and his men trying to kill them for years. Now Saul's dead. Do you hear any celebrating? Are you imagining the parties? Woohoo! King Saul's dead. We got this. Yeah, baby, David's going to be king now. We're going to rock. Uh -uh. <laughs> David had been chased for, by Saul for years, and yet when Saul died, what did David do? He mourned. Not only that, David had the Amalekite executed for his testimony that he put the king to death. So I'm pretty sure that if the Amalekite was stretching the story, he thought, why the heck did I do that? <laughs> Even if David suspected the man was lying, he couldn't have spared the uh, confessed killer of a king. It just wouldn't have been right. Because you see, fear of God must be maintained, and no one should be allowed to be rewarded for killing one of the ones that the Lord has anointed. So what David does next is, is, is filled with tenderness, filled with love, filled with wisdom. David puts together a eulogy in the form of a song. And the main, phrase, main phrase in that song is one that's been repeated many times poetically over the course of history. My, how the mighty have fallen. And in this, in this song that David puts together, uh, David praises Saul's leadership. He praises his accomplishments. Okay, what am I missing here? This was Saul. King, King Saul, the one that David worked for, the one that 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 just uh, missed him by a hair with the first spear that he threw, the one that pinned him to the wall with the second one. Hello? This is the same King Saul. Yet we find David praising his leadership, praising King Saul's accomplishments, and he also mourned the loss of dear friend Jonathan. And you see, I think there's a really, really important lesson here. The best way to make a good transition is to speak honest, honestly of your predecessor. You see, in my mind, it speaks something negative about a man who constantly has to put down the one who, who came before him. So why is this necessary? Even if you agree with policies and practices of the one who who came previous to you, what's gained by tearing them down? The only thing the character assassination does is alienate those who support it and love the predecessor, and it makes you look really, really small. Let me tell you where I first learned this. I had been pastoring, I was associate pastor of, of Las Lunas Church, uh, Christian Church for, for many years, 
and they, the leadership, started going this way. I was the only part of the leadership that didn't feel like that was the place we needed to go. Uh, I'll save you the sort of story, but it, it had to do about it had to do with the type of people we were to go bring into the church. See, you, you guys know because we all sat here together. I'm good with thugs and hookers and drunks and smokers and those who struggle to make a living each week and those who probably don't have the most crystal clear reputation in town. I'm good with that. You know why? Because that's who I are. <laughs> Amen? And that's who Jesus hung out with. I mean, what did he do? He rebuked the Christian leader or the, the, the religious leader. He rebuked him. And what did he do when he threw that big banquet and invited all the richies? Come on in. Come on. Nobody showed up. Nothing. Then he go invite these other people. And they went and they compelled them to come. They didn't show up either. Then he said, you go out to the highways and the byways and you bring those who are poor, those who are without. You bring them to my banquet because there's plenty here. Guess who came?
speaking of him in an honorable way, I was able to build a bridge with those who had who had been under his leadership for so many years. I don't know, maybe you need to apply this lesson to your life somewhere. Maybe it's at home. Maybe it's at work. Maybe it's at school. Maybe it's in the community. Now, some errors do have to be confronted directly, but I'll tell you what, not as many as you would think. I have a I have three really good elders. You know, I'm kind of a I'm kind of wild here. Somebody ticks me off, I'm just gonna let them know, okay? And I've got at least one elder, I won't tell you which one it is, but his initials are Jerry. And it's always <laughs> telling me, calm down, bro. You really don't have to go to them and talk about this. Yes, I do. <laughs> you know, that's a little bit of steak for what I on. First, just because 
because we can do something doesn't mean we should. Now, most husbands I know understand that principle. Like we're already back there, we see the knock on his head. Just because we can do something doesn't mean we should do something. David never viewed Saul as an obstacle to the throne. Did you did you get that as we made the study? Many times they said, look, he's right there, go ahead. Finish him off. I mean, come on, this is your sworn enemy. He's chased you all over the place. But David never viewed Saul as an enemy to the throne. Uh, David sought the Lord's direction instead of trying to make things happen on his own. I mean, think about this. Just because you can change jobs doesn't mean you should. And listen, when you're faced with changing jobs, you really need to keep that decision in prayer. I don't know how many times I pray for somebody and they're going to, to this new job and I'll pray for them and pray for them and say, God, if this is your will, and all, they, all they're looking at is just, you know, I'm going to make more money, I'm going to get more vacation, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that. And they get this new job and it, it devours them. No more time for church, no more time for spiritual things, no more time for anything that has to do with God. And pretty soon they fall away and pretty soon it was just like a memory. So just because you can change jobs doesn't mean you should. And, and, and guys and girls, just because you can have a relationship with someone other than your spouse doesn't mean it's good to do so. And just because you can get away with taking money from the company, it doesn't mean it's right. And just because you get support for a position of leadership or you have votes to win a contest doesn't mean you have to. It doesn't mean it's the wise thing to do. And just because you can cheat young people and get a better grade, it doesn't mean that's what you should do. In fact, Corey Ten Boom asked this question. Is, your pra is prayer your steering wheel or is it your spare tire? I think that's a really, really good question. In other words, do we seek God's guidance as a regular course or do we seek God's guidance only when we're spiritually flat or there's been a blowout in our life? Is prayer your steering wheel? Is it your steering wheel? Or is it your spare tire? How do you view prayer? Prayer should be the thing that guides our daily life. Prayer is not something that we keep in the trunk in case something quits working. Prayer is not something that after you've tried everything else, well, I guess I'm just going to have to pray about it. It should be the first thing we do. I can't help but wonder how many churches are split because a church pushed ahead with some change when the congregation wasn't ready. I wonder how many homes have been weakened because one person pushed ahead with their agenda instead of seeking the Lord's will. You know, it's always a good policy to seek the Lord's guidance before you move forward. So set before the Lord in, in prayer. Search the scriptures. If the way isn't clear, then seek counsel. The Bible tells us there's much wisdom in the counsel of David. Seek some counsel. Evaluate the circumstances. Move forward carefully. Secondly, you see that it's possible to know the truth and not submit to the truth. Hello? It's possible to know what the truth is, but not submit to that truth. Abner knew that David was meant to be the king, but he refused to submit to the truth. In 2 Samuel chapter 3, verse 9, Abner even confessed that he knew God had promised David the kingship. Uh, he had promised David the throne with an oath. He knew what was going on, and I think that's a sober reminder of what is true for so many of us. <coughs> they know the truth about Jesus. They know he's God's son. They know he's the only one who can save, but they won't submit to that truth. You know, I believe that David knew that a king was not to have uh, multiple wives, but he did it anyway. And as a result, David experienced all kinds of family turmoil, all kinds of family heartache. Think about the people driving the car, would you? They may know all the safety rules. They know they're supposed to wear their seatbelt. Okay, we're talking about me. Uh, <laughs> they know they're to keep a safe distance between cars. They know they ought to keep both hands on the wheels. Him and two, I get it. They know they shouldn't drink and drive. Now listen, about me. But many people don't follow these rules. They don't wear seatbelts. They drive while they're talking on the phone. Come on. 
definitely could have undermined the unity of, of Israel. You know, to be honest with you, I thought I was going to get away with that one. Pastor, you need to stop that. <laughs> <laughs> then David did what was right as he condemned the murder and he publicly mourned Abner. He spoke at his funeral, he fasted, and by doing that, uh, David showed that he hadn't ordered the murder of, 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 of Abner, and then the people respected David. But check it out, it's still not over. Next we see the assassination of Israel's death. That's not of Saul. After Abner was killed, the real power behind the throne of Ishbosheth was gone. And two other men, thinking that they were helping David, thinking that they, they were doing King David a favor, they went and they murdered Ishbosheth as he took a nap. They cut off his head and they brought it to David as a souvenir. Yeah. And when they arrived at the home of David, they said in 2 Samuel chapter 4, verse 8, This day the Lord has avenged my Lord, the king, against Saul and his officers. In other words, they claim they were doing God's work. I remember a story about 10 years ago when a man went to a Unitarian church in Tennessee and started shooting people. He said the church was not a true church, which is a true statement. But he said he thought such liberal thinkers needed to be silenced. And so the man presented himself as one doing the work of God. We live this zealot bomb abortion claim that always gets me. They're right, abortion's murder. But to imply that they're doing God's work, but when they go and and, and, and bomb the clinic is a horrible offense to the character of God. And David saw through the plea of these men and that, that said they were serving God. An innocent man was killed in his own home while he was sleeping, and God was not behind these acts. So David executed those men. Now the point here is that David remained patient with the circumstances, uh, even as he was patient with the people of Israel. And because of his patience, the rest of Israel came begging their king. It was a smooth transition there, and it lasted for over 40 years. Now, let's talk about some life lessons with this before we close up. You know, it's inevitable that you and I will face times of transition in our life because change does happen. But we can influence how smoothly the change takes place, whether we're the one provoking the change or we're the one responding to the change. It may be on a board or a committee, it may be an organization, or maybe it's in a relationship. But the point is, is these simple guidelines that we learn from David's example, they can really help us. Refer to those who have gone before you in ways that are honoring. And again, it is never wrong to treat someone else with respect, regardless of who they are. Secondly, seek God's direction. I think we all need to be reminded of that very often. We ought to remind ourselves that just because we can do something, doesn't mean we should. We also need to remember that knowing the truth and doing the truth are two different things. And then thirdly, be patient with people. Be patient with circumstances. A lot of the interpersonal conflict in our life is due to the way, the fact that we insist on having our own way and not being willing to give people a chance to grow. We just want it done the way we want it done. We want it done now. That's what's always been hard for me as a, as a, as a reader is when I give someone a job and they don't do it exactly like I would have done it, it's just like, it just kills me because, you know, I, I'm so smart and I've got everything right and they should have just read my mind and known what I wanted. But a lot of the interpersonal <coughs> conflict in our life is due to the fact that we insist on getting our own way and, and we don't, we're not willing to give people a chance to grow. We're not willing to give people a chance to make mistakes. <coughs> We're not willing to give people a chance to grow. And like David, if we would just be patient, we could even see God help us grow. I want you to see something else this morning. In these chapters, we also see the inescapable nature of sin. You know, it startles me when I read the Bible and I, I see men lying to each other and hating each other and backstabbing to gain positions of influence it's easy to be shocked by reading these kinds of things in the Bible, but these things are also taking place all around us. And on one, on one hand, it shocks me to read these, who were leaders in Israel, who were leaders in the household of faith. Yet on the other hand, I'm so thankful that God showed us these men's frailties. I'm so thankful that he showed us 
their mistakes. He showed us how many of these guys made devastating, bad decisions. Yet God could still use them. Sometimes these even things even describe the tactics and behaviors in our own lives. And these things are all evidence that sin is ingrained in us as individuals and as a society. And you know, we also <coughs> see a whole lot of this. We see Saul, his son, Joab's brother. Uh, You know, on March, chapter, on March 8th, the year 2009, Pastor Fred Winters entered into his pulpit at First Baptist Church in Maryville, just like he had done so many times before. And 10 minutes into his message, he was murdered. It's foolish. It's foolish to continue to live our lives as though uh, we have any kind of guarantee for another day of life. We need to face the reality of death and the ultimate issues of what lies beyond the grave. In fact, James, the half-brother of Jesus, says, so what is your life? It's like a vapor that's here for a moment and then passes away. Life is very uncertain. And the Bible's clear that after death, there's judgment. And those who have failed to measure up to God's standards will face judgment. The notion of getting away with sin, <laughs> that's the thought of the fool. Let me say one more thing. In this passage, we, all see the, we also see the wonder of God's grace. In the midst of of the madness, God was still at work. Even when men were trying to push their agendas, even when things were seemingly going the way men wanted to go, God was still at work. God prevented David from rushing ahead. He was willing to guide his servant, and God fulfilled the promise that he made so many years ago. And it's through the line of David that God shared his greatest act of mercy. Because into this same sin-stained sin world, uh, filled with the smell of death, God sent Jesus. And this descendant of David, this guy from the line of David, God in human form laid down his life for sinful people like you and me. And through his death and his burial and his resurrection, he has brought about forgiveness and a new life to everyone who will put their trust in him. Yet still, he hasn't been recognized as Lord of all. As for now, he waits patiently because he doesn't want anyone to perish, but all to come to everlasting life. And he waits for us come to him. But soon, in God's timing, when the Father's ready, every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. Those who refuse him, they won't enjoy the wonder of heaven. They're going to be forced to endure the torture of hell. And if you're not following Jesus as your Lord and Savior, let me assure you, there's still time, don't now. But let me also assure you, we don't know how much We're reminded that those we trust, those we depend on, those we follow, Jesus now as Savior and Lord, they don't need to fear that transition. Even the transition from death, from life unto death. In fact, David had such a handle on death that he called it the sweet step of death. He says that even though I, I, I go through the valley of the shadow of death, I'll fear no evil. You see, David knew what was on the other side. I hope that you know what's on the other side for you. Because heaven awaits the one who puts their trust in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. For those who put their trust in Him, they don't need to fear the coming of the Lord. Because those who have accepted Him, those who have shared Jesus.